Good afternoon, everybody. This is Bassam Haddad. I'm joined by my uh, better half, uh, Noor Aliqat, and this is Politics in the Time of Corona, episode 10, 11, or 12, somewhere around there, because everything's blending into uh, uh, you know, uh, each other uh, and one another, and we are blending into each other. I, I have a blue... Uh, Uh, nail polish because my daughter thought this would be cool and I thought that it would be cool as well. Uh, so did uh, Nora, of course. Uh, and uh, we are very happy to be here today with a, a wonderful guest from Germany. Uh, her name is Edna Bonhomme and she is a historian of science and a lecturer and writer whose work interrogates the archaeology of post-colonial science. Uh, embodiment and surveillance in the Middle East and North Africa. She joins us from Berlin and will be addressing both her research and uh, the overall situation in Germany regarding the pandemic. Welcome, Edna. Thank you for having me, and I really appreciate the work that you're doing right now in this moment. Thank you very much. I, I'm just going to ask you to start with how you're personally coping with the pandemic, uh, family, relations, friends, uh, Just the personal take on what, uh, what's it look like from your vantage point. So although it's my first time living through a pandemic on a global sense, it's not my first time living through an epidemic. I was in Haiti in 2010 when the cholera outbreak happened shortly after the earthquake um, that basically displaced 1.5 million people. And it was during that time that I had a direct encounter with a, a, an epidemic that very much uh, operated quickly, operated in a way that um, destroyed the lives of many people from the global south. It was very intimate and also just um, quite destructive. What's happening here in the European context is slightly different in the insofar that uh, in Germany and in Berlin, There are about uh, 125,000 cases as of today on the 10th of April and very few deaths compared to Italy, compared to France, compared to UK and even the United States. So in general, the quality of life and the ways in which the epidemic has impacted uh, people here in Germany overall doesn't look the way that it did uh, for the cholera epidemic uh, when I witnessed it in Haiti. So here in Germany, um, on an everyday personal level, I feel quite healthy. Um, most people back, I would say 99% of the population has health care of some sort. Uh, in, there is also a way in which the state and the government has provided resources for people who are out of work. So if a person, even if they're not German and they're a freelancer, then the government has provided emergency funds for up to 5,000 euros to be able to have them survive. Um, I'm lucky enough that in my job, um, even though I don't have to be physically at work because I'm not an essential worker, I can be able to work from home. So I'm very privileged in many ways. Um, at the same time, I am worried for my family that lives in the United States and in Haiti, where particularly in the U.S. context, uh, my aunts, my mother are janitors at public hospitals. So they are working um, in places uh, that uh, people with coronavirus may be and are have been uh, placed, particularly in Miami and New York City. So there's a way in which um, uh, it, having those people and worry about them from a distance uh, makes me uh, concerned about when I will be able to see them again and how to navigate and negotiate uh, what it looks like uh, to witness a pandemic and the inequalities that arise uh, from a distance, especially given that Black people in New York City, in Illinois, Michigan, Alabama, Louisiana, are more likely to contract and or die from the disease because of systemic racism. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think you're, you're highlighting um, uh, one of the things that, you know, people say, well, you know, cholera um, is the uh, equalizer, right? That it doesn't discriminate. And we quickly have found that, that that's absolutely not true. Who, can, who is an essential worker, who can afford to stay at home, who has refuge, who has health care, who, you know, is going to be prioritized, is all going to all affect who survives and who doesn't, why, and why it emphasizes the role of our interdependency internationally, but also the role of the state. And the irony is that you're watching this uh, from Germany, 
um, more concerned about your your family in the U.S. and I that tells us a little bit about the politics of of both places. Before we go there, however, we want to delve into your research. Not only your experience of the epidemic of cholera in Haiti also speaks to your broader research interests of studying um, such epidemics under um, the Ottoman um, Empire, as well as in more recent times in modern history of the Middle East and North Africa, and what outbreaks have looked like in those regions. What Can you tell us a little bit more about your history and insights that you have for us now? So my research on epidemics, uh, particularly for my dissertation, was one of the many ways that uh, uh, my fascinations about science, biology, microbes, viruses, um, and it sprung from uh, particularly studying biology as an undergrad. So I worked um, as a biologist in a lab uh, right after college and then eventually got a master's in public health and wanted to think more deeply about what, is, what does it mean for us to understand diseases, not just as something that comes from divine intervention, which is what uh, people thought for many millions of uh, thousands of years, but also something that is tied to um, traditional healing practices, tied to uh, a certain kind of biological allopatric medicine. And so for me, my work was to think about the ways in which pathogens arise and evolve, uh, specifically from the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries, how they intersect with uh, relationships between animals and plants, how things like ticks, rats, um, and other animals are able to transmit uh, diseases because of the comorbidity between and the coexistence between uh, pathogens and humans. And to think about also how people in the Middle East, North Africa, actually help to uh, create what we could, um, the, uh, the building box for what we understand to be modern medicine. And part of that also stemmed from uh, a kind of uh, reaction towards what had been happening in the United States, which is a demonization of people from the Middle East and North Africa um, and wanting to uh, re pre provide a kind of counter narrative to what has come from that area. So George Salibas' work on Islamic science, as well as uh, Mara and Shafri's work on science in um, Egypt and uh, et cetera, helped to inspire me to think about how we understand the world about microbes, epidemics, the climate, didn't just exist in Europe. <laughs> in fact, if anything, some of those knowledge practices came uh, from very elite, sophisticated Muslim societies uh, from uh, Northern India, or what we now call India, to um, uh, Morocco. And so with that, I actually, in my dissertation, uh, which was entitled Plague, Bodies, and Spaces, tried to figure out the moments in which the bubonic plague and or cholera um, erupted in Alexandria, Cairo, um, to this and the ways in which people were able to manage disease through quarantine, sanitation practices, creating um, irrigation systems and water systems that could provide clean and safe water to, to the population, as well as even basic practices of um, having uh, communal baths and such so that people could be able to have uh, ways to maintain hygiene. And so looking um, at uh, particularly diplomatic records in some cases, or uh, religious documents and endowments that funded some of those public, what I would call public health, but proto-public health institutions is what I tried to look at. And colonialism and European colonialism does a different kind of work, um, as we, we all know, uh, with respect to some of those institutional and charity structures. Uh, but what my work looked at was specifically how, um, how pre-colonial European colonial structures allow public health practices to minimize the spread of epidemics in some cases, but in other cases it did spread just because uh, we don't always have control over um, these viruses, especially in the pre-modern uh, context. Uh, uh, Edna, we're, we want to of course go to Germany, but before doing that, given that you studied the relationship between you know, animals and humans and the transmission of diseases uh, in, in that direction, uh, uh, does this have to do potentially with diet and uh, does it have to do with proximity uh, or uh, how in addition to that and maybe related I am not sure uh, and I'm not trying to echo Trump here uh, is there a relationship between uh, at least in the past 20 years or so 20 20 some years the emergence of uh, these uh, 
pandemics or, or, or these uh, uh, crises from East Asia and um, is, be, between East Asia and the uh, emergence of some of these pandemics? Um, so I would, I would be very cautious to say that, there, that East Asia is specifically responsible or um, the place in which uh, epidemics and or diseases occur. In fact, if anything, there are microbes everywhere and there are microbes that existed 1,000, 2,000, uh, 5,000 years ago that are still evolving today in a way that the malaria that existed during the Greek period um, is a different version and um, in some cases get re-triggered with certain um, animal populations. In fact, one particular book that looks at the kind of evolution of um, what we now call like uh, avian flu or uh, influenza looks at the uh, is um, Mike Davis's The Monster at Our Door and it looks at the relationship between influenza and how it has transformed itself. And in, in the, but the case of H5N1 or what we call the avian flu, it did emerge from a particular poultry uh, bird population in East Asia, but there are other types of flus that emerge all the time in different populations throughout the world. Um, it's in some cases what ends up happening is that we um, there are some instances when pandemics do arise because of the ways in which people travel, the ways in which uh, diseases uh, can go quickly through trains, planes, etc. So the the question around mass trans mass transportation population density and other factors might have more of a role to play than whether or not it arrived from you know East Asia versus. Africa versus Europe versus et cetera. So what we see right now with the latest coronavirus, um, COVID-19, is that part of why it is, is so um, kind of special is that it travels so quickly because of people could be, get on a plane. In fact, rich people help to carry a lot of the, 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 the virus to even to Egypt, to South Africa, et cetera. And so it became, it's becoming global because we live in a world in which uh, certain populations, those who are actually part of the elite, are able to um, move through the world without any borders, whereas you know poor working class people don't have that privilege. So I, I would I would think more about the systems that are currently in place that allow for certain forms of travel that didn't exist a hundred years ago versus well where did it originate from? Because there there are viruses and uh, bacteria that are always evolving, co-evolving inside of us and in our environment all the time. You know, on that note, and and this is the thing, just a note on Trump. They have found in Seattle, um, in, in Vancouver, as well as in New York, that the first cases were infections from uh, people of European origin and not from East Asia. So, but, but obviously the empirics don't tend to matter when you're uh, on a racist rampage. One last question about your research, what I, which I think we're, we're so lucky to have you and, and our viewers will be really interested to hear. You say that the that these the you know north africa has been the site of a lot of uh modern science around responding to epidemics have there been any takeaways and insights that you can give us about our, our lessons for survival how how we've survived in the past um based on on your research and what that tells us today so i would say that survival is not just a question of uh therapeutics in the sense of taking medication, which of course helps and is able to give us, when we do have things like vaccines or for viruses, of course, to help uh, stave off viruses and antibiotics to help stave off uh, bacteria, that goes a long way. Um, at the same time, therapeutics and healing and coping also comes with community. It comes with care. It comes with the sense of ritual, meditation, and having, um, and not in a religious sense, but because if that's not something someone wants to do, but being mindful and having mindful practices that uh, allow people to heal in whatever form and shape that they need to. Um, and there's a way in which people can mix and match some of those healing practices. So one of the things that I find fascinating about looking at the 18th or 19th century is thinking about how people would use amulets and magic squares alongside taking some kind of potion that they thought would work as well because it provided them with some kind of psychological ease and that 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 is that alleviating the anxiety goes so far in a moment especially now where uh, people have a lot of anxiety because of the uncertainty because of not knowing exactly when there could be a sense of normalcy for the lives that they might want to lead or even just not knowing when they could see their families, if borders have been closed, etc. So the idea about um, 
you know, non-physical uh, therapeutics and community and care is very key and essential, I would say, uh, to healing back then and even now. Uh, thank you, Edna. Uh, we would like to shift to Germany and learn from you, from your vantage point, what uh, does the scene look like, the context, especially that the past week, I think we have learned that Germany is among the top five or six uh, in Europe, at least, and uh, in terms of uh, people contracting the virus. So if you can shed light on the situation in Germany, how the government has dealt with uh, the pandemic and uh, what worked, what didn't, and, and what, what's the outlook? So as you know, COVID-19, the spread of it has been very sudden and it's been very drastic. And I would say that countries in the southern part of Europe, like Italy and Spain, have been hardest hit. And it's because of that that um, the governments in Europe, in varying degrees, um, have decided to, in some cases, have isolationist methods of shutting down government, businesses, um, and in some have enacted early detection measures so that they can be able to test people uh, quite early on. So in Germany, um, they have uh, active testing. They've put into kind of basically within the city of Berlin, ordinances to encourage social distancing um, so that people uh, are supposed to maintain 1.5 meters, et cetera. Um, and so uh, this is a very similar model to the South Korea model, but not full on. Uh, they haven't required masks like uh, Czech Republic has. In fact, in Czech Republic, quite early on, people had a kind of solidarity effort to wear masks as a way to protect each other um, as um, you know, for, from the, the illness. And part of what is going on in terms of how these governments, including Germany, decides what they want to do is that they don't want to impose um, draconian measures on the one hand and limit full movement. So I'm able to go to the grocery store or go jogging, et cetera, but group um, gatherings of more than two people are technically not allowed at the moment. Um, be, and because they've canceled schools, factories, clubs, et cetera, the, the state has actually stepped in to say, uh, that they will pay for 60 to 70 percent of foregone wages for about uh, 2 million people or so whose hours were cut, which costs about 10 billion euros. So that's a lot of money, but that's a necessary step that needs to be taken in a current moment in which people who are socially isolated, in some cases we're living paycheck to paycheck, um, need that material support. Um, and then beyond that, what is raising the question of, um, and for me as a scholar who's currently based at the Max Planck Institute, uh, raising the question of, well, how do we have our meetings? How do we teach? Many things have been moved online for the Phi University and the Humboldt University. Um, students are like, we're all learning and relearning how to engage in this virtual world that opens up a, a, a host of questions as on for things like privacy, which is part of the, um, the tension that's happening even amongst people who are trying to figure out how to organize. One thing that's also coming up, which is um, what does it mean, particularly in the German context, uh, for migrants and refugees who don't have the privilege to be socially distant. That is to say, in some cases, people are put into quarters and lagas, as they call it, where there's six to eight people in a room and there's very poor circulation. What has been happening is that some um, um, uh, refugees and migrants have been protesting this um, in Germany, uh, those from the African continent and elsewhere, to say that they want proper facilities uh, to protect themselves from these uh, from, from coronavirus. So it's opening up and raising a host of issues about who gets to be protected, who doesn't, what does it mean to close the borders and prevent people from nearby countries like um, Turkey, et cetera, not to be able to come and face uh, potential risk of being contracted and not getting the care that they need. Um, so this is the, the German question, I would say, as a government, it is working for people like me, uh, who are, a pri I'm a privileged migrant, uh, but it may not necessarily be the best situation for those who are working poor, refugee, etc. I think that's really interesting to highlight that, you know, beyond the very stark comparison that here is Germany providing for 60 to 70 percent of wages for two million people in order to ensure 
the public health. In the United States, it's a one-time disbursement of $1,200 that we're not sure when it arrives and, it, and it's not even for the most precarious populations. It's not necessarily vetted. Um, but anything that you can tell us um, in addition, so there's this, this politicization around refugees. Are there other ways within Germany that it's become politicized that maybe there is um, racial overtones or even um, socio, political, economic overtones that have created cleavages within the country? So I would say when the, epi when the pandemic first um, was aware, uh, people were first aware of it in last month, at least in this country, there is uh, some sinophobia um, that was happening and documented by people on the U-Bahn, which is the uh, subway, as well as other kinds of um, racialized ways in which people are interacting with each other. However, in the past couple weeks or so, I would say that there's been a lot more solidarity with respect to honoring and uh, the people who are essential workers, so grocery store, um, mm -hmm. you know, cashiers, etc., to nurses and doctors as such. So there have been collective acts of like clapping and chanting of, in neighborhoods, uh, or in some cases, people have been providing food relief for the homeless, because there are there are there is a homeless population here. Um, and so people, um, I'm part of a couple of uh, Ber like Berlin-based uh, networks in which we, people can go and um, put on masks and get food, buy, do grocery shopping, and then uh, deliver food to the people who are elderly, immunocompromised, migrants, etc. So there is this um, kind of human solidarity that is possible even in a moment in which there's a crisis going on. And I find that absolutely beautiful and telling that um, people power and the power of actual like, you know, communities to come together during this moment is, is, is absolutely necessary to overcome um, many of the damage that is, is, is being done to everyday life. Um, and then beyond that, I would say that um, it also raises the question of like, how do we organize when we can't physically get into the same room or the same space? And technology has been has been part of that way. You know, how do you have debates? How do you have conversations? What does collectivity look like when some people don't have access to a computer? Like my, my parents do not have a computer. They don't have email address. They don't have, they don't know what Facebook is. My mother just got a smartphone last year. And so their world and how they connect is absolutely different than, than what we're doing right now. And learning to like navigate between those who have that digital capacity and that fluency versus those who don't is, is something that's gonna be an, a kind of international question as we move forward uh, in this uh, current uh, crisis. Thank you, uh, Edna. Uh, before we wrap up, if you could, first of all, I would love for you to uh, wrap up with anything that you feel we have missed that you think should be highlighted in the case of Germany. And uh, of course, given the proximity of everything to everything in, in Europe, if there is a connection there uh, that, that we missed. Uh, and as you do that, if you can just share with us, uh, uh, you know, regarding today, specifically Saturday, April, 11th. 11th. Like, what, no, y'all, it's the 11th. Come on, come on. <laughs> what are the basic figures and data in terms of uh, in infections and, and uh, casualties and so on in Germany? And I know that by the time we release this, things might change a bit. But if you can close with, with, with uh, uh, some remarks that you feel have not been addressed potentially or anything you'd like to address. And then Nura can tag onto my question before we give you the last word. Okay? It's all you. So... It Okay, so in terms of um, numbers and statistics, uh, on the 11th of April, 2020, <laughs> Germany has about 122 case confirmed cases of coronavirus, 2,736 deaths, and 53,000 have recovered. And um, that's compared to 125,000 in France, uh, 147,000 in Italy, 161,000 in Spain, and 500,000 in the US. So the U.S. is unfortunately number one in this particular case of having the most confirmed cases, more, and Germany has more confirmed cases than China. Unfortunately, the cases are still on the rise. That is to say, it hasn't reached, it hasn't flattened out yet. Um, fortunately for me in Berlin, where I currently live in Germany, 
Um, it's quite low in terms of only having about 6,000 cases. And most of the cases are actually in Bavaria and the South, um, one of the richest provinces and uh, the Northwestern regions. Um, so there is an unevenness as to where it's happening within the country, but in general, people are more likely to recover here um, percentage-wise than, for example, the cases that we saw in, in um, Italy. And a lot of that might have to do with early on intervention with respect to encouraging social distancing, testing, having facilities, there are enough ventilators, et cetera. I would say that one debate that has been coming up and um, Southern Europeans have brought this up, which is the extent to which the EU has been able to or not provide uh, financial and other health uh, uh, resources to Southern Europeans during this period in which with Italians, they were donated uh, ventilators from China. Um, they, you know, eventually Germans donated ventilators, and it creates this kind of intra-European, somewhat colonial-style situation where the um, Southern Europeans are not afforded, or they feel like they're not afforded the same kinds of financial and or health um, benefits. And so there's a, a live debate about what is the relationship's status and the hierarchy in the EU and how how is it that some of the Southern European states are being impacted based on the resources versus the Northern ones? And, you know, it's, I'm not European, I'm not a European citizen, so I can't, um, uh, I don't have a huge stake except to say that I'm currently in a place that has those resources, but I, I will stand in solidarity to ensure that those things should be distributed evenly as opposed to um, just here. Here, here to that, and Ashe and Amen. I mean, really. Um, really this, Edna, this was lovely, tight, and informative, and we kept the time. We don't manage to do this in most of our interviews. Uh, you've been so um, eloquent and have managed to, uh, you know, squeeze in so much within within the lot of time. We actually. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. If Nuda has anything else to share. No, I look forward to um, continuing to follow your work. We also know that you're Absolutely. an artist, so we encourage listeners and viewers uh, to follow you and to see the, the great productivity that you're providing to the world and also to see your dissertation become a book that yes. we, we get to share. I also, um, I totally forgot to say this because I always forget about all kinds of things. Um, I have a podcast right now that's called Decolonization in Action. So um, I, that happens uh, once a week, once every other week, and it's just on highlighting decolonial voices, scholars, activists, artists. And then I just had a piece published in Al Jazeera couple, uh, some weeks ago on the coronavirus and how it is tied to inequalities and colonialism. So. Um, if you want to get those, then for I can sure. Yeah. For sure. those resources. Thank you. We can add your podcast to the to the post, right? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, well, beautiful. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, uh, Edna. We'll, we hope to see you again and speak with you again, perhaps under better circumstances. Take care. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Bye, and stay safe out there. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye.